Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. On this episode, we are joined by Jason Pfeiffer, editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, and author of the book, Build for Tomorrow, as well as host of the podcast of the same name. Prior to Entrepreneur, Jason served as an editor at Men's Health, as well as deputy editor of Maxim Magazine, and is also a keynote speaker and startup advisor. We hope you enjoy. We are fired up today about spending some time with Jason Pfeiffer, arguably the world's busiest human being, but we appreciate him making some time for us here today. Hosting two podcasts, having multiple entrepreneurial ventures, writing a book, speaking, helping people. Can you share some of the pivots in your life that led you to the point where you are today? Oh, well, first of all, thank you so much. I'm sure I'm not the busiest person in the world, but I like to keep myself busy and I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the biggest pivots really was the thing that led to the life and career that I have right now. I'll tell you very quick of it. I became editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine in 2016. And before that, I really was just a media guy. I thought of myself as, you know, I mean, I was a media guy. I worked in magazines, a lot of different magazines. I started out in newspapers. And then I started this job, which I really originally thought of as just a magazine making job, come in, make the magazine better, think about the brand, expand. But I started to spend all this time, obviously, with entrepreneurs and absorb the way that they thought. And it changed the way that I think. And one of the biggest moments for that was in 2018, I had a book come out with my wife. My wife and I wrote a romantic comedy together. It's called Mr. Nice Guy. And uh, it was uh, really interesting because when my friends from the writing community heard that we sold this book to, you know, big press, St. Martin's Press, it came out. People read it, sold TV rights. It was a lot of fun. They said, congratulations, that's awesome. Entrepreneurs, when I told them about this, they said, so what are you going to do with it? Because to them, the only reason to do something is because it leads to something else. Because as I realized, entrepreneurs think vertically. They have vertical thinking. You stack one thing on top of the other. The only reason to do something is because it is a foundation upon which something else will be built. Most people don't think that way. Most people, myself included in the past, think horizontally. I do one thing, then I move on to the next, then I do that thing, and I move on to the next, and I never build upon them. And I have shifted my mindset from horizontal thinking to vertical thinking. It has radically changed the way that I approach my work, my life, and it's been everything. Huh. That is pretty fantastic revelation to hit at this stage in your life. You know, one of the key concepts that you speak about are these, uh, I think what you call them, wouldn't go back moments. Yeah. Can you expand on that for us? Because I think it's a fascinating concept. Sure. So my theory of change, I think a lot about change because my thesis is that the most successful people that I have met throughout my career, and certainly in my time at Entrepreneur, the one thing they have in common is adaptability. I want to understand how they do it. How do they go through moments of change, either that they've created or that have come upon them and come out the other side stronger? And I realized that change happens in four phases. Number one, panic. Number two, adaptation. Number three, new normal. Number four, wouldn't go back. And wouldn't go back to me means that moment where we have something that we say, I wouldn't want to go back to a moment before I had this. And this is something that we will all get to, whether you want to or not, because you can't opt out of the future. Change will come to you. But I do think that if you're conscious of it, if you're more open-minded, if you are willing to seek gain where others see loss, then I think that you will reach that wouldn't go back moment faster. And that is your competitive advantage. Which of those four stages do you think hangs most people up? Do they just stop at the panic stage and just try to get out of that panic feeling, heading back to where they were before? Yeah. I mean, I I think a lot of people never progress past panic. Now, sometimes you have to, right? I mean, if you get laid off from your job, you're going to panic, but you can't panic forever. You got to do something. And so you do move on whether you want to or not into adaptation to new normal. So I would argue that a lot of people do stop at panic, right? A lot of people will go and they will try something new. It won't work out immediately. They will panic. They will retreat. That's the end. But I think, you know, a lot of people probably also get stuck. I haven't really thought much about this, but I would imagine a lot of people get stuck at new normal. Hmm. When we panic, the thing that we want most of all is something else that is comfortable. And so you get to new normal. Now, new normal is fine, but the problem is that new normal isn't really capitalizing on the opportunity, right? New normal is 
oh, well, I had a job and I, uh, I lost it or I, I hated it or something. And I panicked and I found another job and it's not perfect either, but I'm going to stay here because I just needed to get under the roof and away from the rain. You know, that, that's one way of thinking. But I think that if you really push yourself, there's an opportunity for wouldn't go back, which is when you're radically transforming the way that you're thinking about what you're doing and then maximize it, build upon it, then you're really somewhere. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. We've been talking abstracts the whole time. Let's start small. So there is a woman named Lena who owns a company called Lena's Wigs in Baltimore. It's a wig store. And before the pandemic, she operated it like a regular storefront which is to say people could walk in and browse the store. You know how the storefront works. And she had to hire, she hired somebody who would greet people and help customers out. And then the pandemic comes along and she is no longer able to welcome people into her store as she did before. And so she's thinking, well, how do I survive? Move to an appointment only model. Now, appointment only is not some radical idea that she'd never thought of before, right? It was it's obviously available to her at any time, but she had always discarded it. And the reason she did was because she thought, well, that's just too much friction. It's too much work for somebody to buy the wig, to make an appointment, wait, and then come in. And so she didn't want to add that friction, and therefore she always ran it as a storefront. But when she was forced to, she had to do something. She went to appointment only. And what she discovered absolutely delighted and fascinated and surprised her. And that was that moving to appointment only actually drove more business. Her profits went up. Her costs went down. Her customers were happier. Why? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because as it turns out, her customers are not the people who are walking in off the street. You know, she had been operating this thing as a storefront, but the average person who buys a wig from her does not randomly stroll in off the street. I mean, a wig is a personal purchase. It, people are usually buying it because of a health condition or, or, or a religious reason. And those are people who are not just like wandering in off the street. Also, those are the kinds of people who would much prefer a private experience. They'd be very happy to book an appointment and come in in person by themselves where they don't have a bunch of randos coming in off the street. And then she didn't have to pay someone to stand there and greet these randos off the street who were going to come in and never buy a wig anyway. So she was spending money on customers who were never going to buy anything. And instead, she wasn't actually serving in the best possible way the customers who were buying something. And this change forced her to rethink that. And once she recognized that, she said, well, how can I maximize that? And so then she started to think more about how can she serve customers? She started to lean more into her website, into her digital presence. She started to explore, are there ways to do um, you know, fittings virtually to save people time? And now her business has grown. She says to me, of course, I wouldn't go back to the way it was before. So she's sticking with the complete appointment only model now. So really, it forced her to think also not just about who her customer is, but what the customer experience ought to be. That's right. I mean, ultimately, what she was forced to do here was to reconsider the impossible, right? Which is to say that she was she had an idea of what was possible and what was not possible with her business. And then change forced her to reevaluate that, to say, you know, maybe the idea that I need is one that I had left outside of my boundaries. And oftentimes the greatest ideas for our lives and our businesses are not like, you know, they weren't beamed down from Mars and not some supernatural force. They were just things that we had thought about and said, nah, can't do that. Too difficult, too hard, too complicated. But in fact, that was the answer. It was the answer all along. Right. So one of the real go forward takeaways from the pandemic for business people is to think about the disruptions that actually helped their business or the ones that they could should keep, not just ever try to go back the way it used to be. And that those disruptions are actually the creators of opportunity. If, if you can think of these things as a puzzle and the solution to that puzzle is greater opportunity rather than this disruption is actually just something that I need to I need to kind of try to sidestep or I've got to hold things together exactly how they are. It'll break and then I'll just reconstitute it exactly the way that it was before. That's how you get stuck in the past. Right. And you talk about putting pieces together. So this is a segue into the, the book build for tomorrow. Can you outline the, the main premises in the book there and, and what people can gain from that? Yeah. The book is oriented around that idea of the four phases of change, panic, adaptation, new normal, wouldn't go back. I structured the book in a way in which, so each each section of the book is one of those phases. And then there are four chapters in each section that are all the smartest entrepreneurs who I have met, as well as the history of innovation, which I study a lot for my podcast by the same name, Built for Tomorrow. The reason I wrote this is because as I was talking to people throughout my job at Entrepreneur, I just became absolutely fascinated with how these people were navigating this. You know, I, I started to realize that navigating change, being adaptable is not something you're born with. It's something you can learn and people get better at it over time. Oftentimes I'll ask people, how did you know how to navigate this crisis, for example? And their answer is always because I did it before. 
I was just talking to this Ukrainian entrepreneur. He has done so much to adapt during war. He got his team out of Ukraine and Russia. He has pivoted uh, marketplaces. He has changed uh, policies to support his Ukrainian clients. It's been uh, remarkable. And I said, well, how, how did you know how to do any of this? And he said, the answer is, I've been in business 16 years. I've had a number of companies before. I've been in crisis before, never been in war, never thought I would, never wanted to be. Nobody's prepared for war, but I am prepared for crisis. And so I know how to adapt. And I'm just leaning on that. And that is what I wanted everybody to have access to. How do people do that? What are the lessons from moving through moments of change like that? And I was fascinated for myself and I, and I thought it'd be really useful for others. So that's where the book comes from. I think it's terrific. Yeah, people that study career trends say that about half the jobs that exist today are in fields that didn't exist 30 years ago. And you know what's crazy about that? 30 years ago, when people saw the change that was ultimately going to create these jobs, they said, oh no, stop, because, we, because this is the destruction of jobs. This, is, I mean, this happens over and over. You see it today in, in all sorts of ways, but it, it's sort of easier to talk about in the past because we know how it played out. Musicians were furious at the development of the phonograph, the first record player, absolutely furious at it. I mean, they, they opposed it. They refused to be recorded. I mean, John Philip Sousa made like it just these hilarious, insane arguments against the recorded music technology. There's a piece you can find it. He wrote uh, this piece called The Menace of Mechanical Music. It was published in Appleton's magazine in 1906. And what he makes a bunch of hilarious arguments against recorded music technology. But the one that I love the most, he said that when you bring recorded music technology, when you bring the phonograph, early record player into the home, it will replace all forms of live music, right? There's no reason why anybody would perform in the home once they have a machine that would do it. And then because mothers usually sing to their children, mothers would stop doing that because again, why would you do that when you have a machine that can do it? And because children grow up to imitate their mothers, the children would now grow up to imitate the machines and thus we would raise a generation of machine babies. That was his argument. <laughs> and it's right, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. But it's because John Philip Sousa was like sort of operating in a vision of a very fixed world, right? Which is to say that the only jobs that will ever exist for musicians are the jobs that already exist for musicians. And now this machine is going to come along and take some of them away. And we still operate in that mindset, that mindset drives government policy today. Oh, well, we can't let more immigrants into the country because we only have so many jobs. It's not how it works, guys. And so instead, the, what happened? Well, the phonograph is followed by the radio, uh, which is followed by all sorts of other advancements in, in music. And now you have a bazillion. I mean, today, just think about all the jobs that did not exist in music. For everything from DJs to uh, sound engineers. I mean, there's a bazillion jobs now in music that just simply didn't exist back in a time when the only way to listen to music was for having somebody perform live in front of you. And as a result of this mechanical music, John Philip Sousa is better known than he ever would have been in his own day. That's absolutely right. John Philip Sousa would have been forgotten to time if it wasn't for recordings of his music. Very, very true. Fascinating examples. You know, about 50 years ago, a professor at Harvard Business School wrote an article called Marketing Myopia and basically talked about how the train companies, railroad companies, had a great chance to invest in the automobile, but they passed because they said, well, we're, we know we're in the train business. Blockbuster had a chance to buy control and stake of Netflix and passed on it because no, no, it's not going to work. People are going to come to the store. That's right. And of course, famously, Kodak was the one of the creators of digital cameras and then basically just shelved the product until somebody else did it and killed them. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how that can happen. So we got to stay nimble. We got to stay open. And we got to realize that flexibility is a state of mind and adaptability are the things we do because of that state of mind. Amen. Well, one kind of final question. What are some, some strategies that you could share with us about how to deal with unexpected setbacks? I've had plenty of setbacks in my career. I mean, starting with my very first job, which I, I started out as a community newspaper reporter in Gardner, Massachusetts, and, uh, and I despised it. And I left after a year and I had no idea what to do with myself. I sat in this bedroom in, in, in rural Massachusetts, staring out into a graveyard, which is what I live next to. You know, if, if you hit a brick wall, there are plenty of ways to get through or around or over that brick wall. But I'm going to tell you that the best thing that you can do is start before you hit the brick wall. I have a, a theory of work, and that theory is to work your next job. I think that in front of you, in front of me, in front of everybody, right now, we have two sets of opportunities. Opportunity set A, opportunity set B. Opportunity set A is everything that is asked of you. So if you have a job, you show up to that job, you got a boss, and that boss needs you to do things, that's how you're evaluated. That's opportunity set A. Opportunity set B is everything that's available to you that nobody's asking you to do. Mm. I submit to you 
opportunity set B is always more important, infinitely more important. It's not to say that opportunity set A is unimportant because obviously if you don't fulfill what is required in opportunity set A, you will not have an income and that's important. But if you only focus on opportunity set A, if you only focus on what is being asked of you, then you will only be qualified to do the thing that you're already doing. And that's not growth. So I say, be constantly mindful of opportunity set B. What could that be? It could be something in your work. Are there, are there things that you could learn? Are there teams that you could join? Are there responsibilities that you could take on so that you're growing, you're developing new skills? But it could also be stuff outside. I mean, you know, you know how I know how to talk on a microphone in an animated way that hopefully you've tolerated for the last 20 minutes. It's because I started a podcast a couple of years ago. Nobody asked me to do that, but I just thought, you know, I should understand this medium better. And so I went and I got myself a microphone. I plugged it into my computer and I figured out how to make a podcast. And that has led to all sorts of unbelievable opportunities, uh, both, you know, financial and podcast is the thing that helped me develop a lot of the ideas that then led to the book. And none of that would have been possible unless I just did it myself. Nobody asked me to do it. Nobody was standing around saying, Jason Pfeiffer, make a podcast. And my whole career, every time that I've hit a wall and I've hit plenty of them, every time I stepped back and I said, well, what else do I know? What do I have available to me? Because I took some initiative because I pushed myself at some time to do something that I didn't need to do, but that I wanted to do. And what did I learn as a result? And that is always the way forward. Always. You can start that today. What is available to you? What are you interested in? I don't care. Don't, don't tell me you don't have the time. Don't tell me you don't have the time because you know what? That's not how time works. Nobody has the time. I didn't have time to start a podcast. Not how it works. But I, I can't stand the, the, the phrase, I don't have the time. And the reason for that is because nobody literally, nobody's like, well, I have a spare two hours in my day. So I guess I'll go figure out how to fill it. That's not how, it's not how time works. <laughs> nobody has time, right? Instead, what happens is that time expands under pressure. That's how it works, right? It's like, it's like a balloon. You don't stretch a balloon so that you can fit air into it. You blow air into the balloon and then it expands. Yeah, that's right. Add something to your day. And then you will, you will be forced to move things around. You'll be forced to re restate your priorities to say, you know what, this thing that I've been doing for a long time, it doesn't really get me anywhere. Maybe I'll drop that and I'll devote the time to this. Or maybe, the, you know what, there's a more efficient way to do that. I spend five hours doing this thing, but actually I think I could probably do it in three. That's how you do it. That's how you make the time. Well, it sounds like you're thinking vertically in that regard too, which I think is fantastic. That's right. Well, Jason, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate your time massively. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And of course, the book is called Build for Tomorrow. You can find it wherever books are sold. Best of success to you. Keep it rocking. Thanks, Jason. Thanks so much. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening.